Our topic tonight is the story of Galileo's trial. And so this isn't only a presentation about uh, the trial of Galileo and uh, the history of that, but also then the history of the story of it and uh, how that story has gone through a couple changes and reiterations and retellings and, and different uses as it's been repurposed uh, over the years. So I want to start, start a little bit by just thinking of stories and stories we tell. So this uh, right here is a picture of me in the middle being held by my mom there. <laughs> so this is me and my maternal ancestors in 1972. So my mom is holding me, there's my uh, sister uh, being held by my mom's mom. Uh, her uh, dad is next uh, to uh, my grandma, so my grandma and grandpa Erickson. And then on the other side is my mom's mom's parents, my great grandparents, uh, Jim and Myrtle Greer. So Jim Greer, my great grandfather, um, was, uh, he's from Illinois, but it's deep south Illinois, so he's kind of an old southern boy, and he was quite an amazing storyteller. Uh, he was born in a log cabin in Cypress, Illinois in 1895. He is the son of Albert Jackson G Greer, who was always known as AJ, and Sophronia Beer, uh, Bear, Sophronia Bear. And he completed only a few years of elementary education, but he was a very, very gifted storyteller. When he would tell stories, he routinely claimed to be half Indian and half bear. <laughs> and uh, the half bear part is because his mom was a bear. In other words, Sophronia Bear was her uh, maiden name. Uh, but there was a little bit more of the legend to why he would say that his dad, AJ, uh, was an Indian or half Indian or something like that. So um, as a result of that, if we do kind of like this family uh, tree, um, uh, it wasn't that it, AJ had also claimed to be half Indian. Uh, and so in other words, he was claiming that his mother, Mary Elizabeth McIntosh, was Cherokee. And actually, um, what they eventually kind of meant was, in fact, that his grandmother was Cherokee. <laughs> and the family had a tradition that they'd come from North Carolina during the time of the Trail of Tears. The Trail of Tears traveled, you know, where the Cherokees were forcibly removed from their um, homelands in Georgia and North Carolina uh, by the U.S. federal government and were taken west to new territory in what is now Oklahoma. Um, but anyway, that trail, um, you know, went across just a little bit of southern Illinois, which is uh, where uh, the family believed that they had come from North Carolina along with the other Indians and stayed. So anyway, to get to that half, that half Indian and half bear story, um, in fact, actually, uh, you know, if you do the, do the math on it, it would have only be that uh, my grandpa Greer was, whatever that is, I'm trying to think, it's half, one quarter, one eighth Indian. And what I always kind of t said when I told the story was that I was one 256th Indian. Uh, and that, of course, that math actually also doesn't work. But let's say if Adeline Boren had been full-blooded Cherokee, which anyway, we'll get to more about that if not, um, then I actually would have been 164th Indian. And so that would have been how um, the family tradition was. And my uh, mother's mother, uh, Myrtle Louise Greer, was a, uh, Erickson, was a, um, uh, prodigious genealogist. She always did genealogy and was trying to trace down family history. And she wanted to find the story and find out that it was true. Uh, of course, we now live in an era when we can do fairly easy genetic testing. And lots of my cousins have done gene testing and they found out we don't actually have any Cherokee blood. And so despite the fact that this had been a very popular story that Grandpa Greer told and his father and so on, um, it's not actually, it doesn't have any basis. All right, but it was too good a story. I'm half Indian and half bear for him to not keep telling. I wanna tell another story that I grew up with. We were talking, uh, when I'm talking about the lecture next week, about the, success, about the restoration movement, uh, the Latter-day Saint tradition, the Mormonism. So when 
Uh, the church was originally created by the founder, Joseph Smith Jr. in 1830, and was called the Church of Christ. Um, when Joseph Smith was killed in 1844, the church split apart and had different successors, the most prominent of which Brigham Young led a group to Utah, uh, and his successors to this day are the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, what we call the LDS Church, a very famous Mormon church in Utah. And because Brigham Young was the senior apostle at the time uh, that Joseph Smith died, and he took over as successor, each of Brigham Young's successors down to the present day has always been the senior most apostle of the LDS Church. And so they are continually led. They're led now by uh, the guy who was the senior most apostle when the preceding church president died and so forth. In the Community of Christ tradition that I'm a part of, uh, the successor uh, was Joseph Smith Jr.'s eldest son, Joseph Smith III. Uh, and, and within our tradition, all the way up until 1996, the leader of the church was always uh, within the Smith family. Uh, although the church never made the claim that the Smiths had to be the leader, rather our claim is that Joseph Smith Jr. appointed his son to be the successor. Joseph Smith III appointed his son, and so on and so forth, uh, down until 1996 when one of the... Um, and it was the last Smith leader of the church appointed somebody who was not a Smith to be the leader of the church. So the last uh, Smith to lead the church is Wallace B. Smith. He was president of Community of Christ, then known as the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, from 1978 to 1996. He is the son, in turn, of Wallace, I'm sorry, W. Wallace Smith, who was the son of Joseph III, who was the son of Joseph Smith Jr., who is the founder of the movement. So in other words, all the way up until 1996, the church was actually led by someone who's merely the great-grandson of the founder. So Wallace B. Smith, uh, however, did not appoint, he didn't have sons. Uh, there are plenty of Smiths still in the church. Um, he does have daughters, uh, but he didn't appoint his children or anyone in the Smith family to be his successor, and instead he appointed uh, w. Grant McMurray uh, to be the next leader of the church, which, uh, uh, and W. Mc McMurray, uh, Grant McMurray um, led the church until uh, he left uh, as president, and now Steve Vesey is the president of the church. So W. Uh, Wallace B. Smith retired in 1996, and he's alive today as emeritus church president. Okay, so when I was growing up, as a kid, um, I grew up in the LDS Church, the Utah Mormon Church. Uh, and the president of the church when I was a child was named Spencer W. Kimball. And there was often told the story uh, when W. Wallace Smith was president of the RLDS Church. And I was told this story multiple times that, uh, that they were not, the, that Wallace, um, I'm sorry, that the president of the RLDS Church didn't have any sons. And so they were going, the RLDS church was going to run out of prophets. And so as a result, the leader of the LDS church, who was the next living relative, Spencer W. Kimball somehow, was going to become president of Community of Christ, president of the RLDS church. And so that was a story that I heard a bunch of different times when I was young. Um, in, in a lot of ways, it didn't make any sense because again, Spencer W. Kimball is not actually a Smith. So what I later found out was that that story originated when the LDS Church did have a Smith president. So from 1970 to 1972, Joseph Fielding Smith, who is a descendant of uh, Joseph Smith's brother, Hiram Smith, um, uh, was a Smith president, and this is when that story originated. So in fact, the relationship between the two was uh, that they are second cousins once removed, Wallace B. Smith, uh, from the elder line, from or actually Hiram is older, but from the line that goes directly back to Joseph Smith as opposed to uh, the brother line, which brings you to the Joseph Fielding Smith. So my point here about this is that when I heard this story and it was told about Spencer W. Kimball, who's not a Smith at all, 
it didn't make any sense whatsoever. But the story was still being told because when it had been created, it was such a great story, the idea that um, the president of the one church was going to get to be the president of the other church because the royal line was going to die out. Um, the story kept getting told even though it no longer made any sense. It was never true to begin with, but it was a great story. How did Spencer W. Gimble then fit in? It doesn't fit in <laughs> to that story. Sometimes it's too good uh, to have a story to stop telling it. All right, so let's get to the Galileo story. So a couple years ago, uh, I was on a uh, wonderful podcast with a friend of mine, John DeLynn. Uh, he has a big podcast called Mormon Stories, where he interviews people within the Latter-day Saint movement, and he was talking to me. And at one point or other, um, I was, anyway, the case I was trying to make here was for organized religion in the 21st century. I was saying, although many organized religions in the 21st century are hostile to science, that that's not a characteristic that is inherent to religion. It is simply, um, you know, maybe that evangelicals might be kind of hostile to it, or especially youngers, creationists, and so on, people who are biblical literalists and so on, who read the Bible as if it were a history book uh, and read it literally, they have to be um, hostile to science because the Bible is not a history book and it can't be led, <laughs> read literally. But anyway, I also said, though, far from being medieval, those modern fundamentalist religions that are hostile to science are actually a recent historical development. So uh, medieval, the medieval church actually uh, had a very, uh, very different and very pro-science um, view. It's a modern reaction that has caused this sort of hostility to science. So um, John, though, pushed back on me, and he wanted to have this example, for example, the Galileo story. Uh, story. And so when you tell it in extreme shorthand, he said to me, what about Galileo, who was burned at the stake for using a telescope to prove that the Earth goes around the sun. And so um, if you know the Galileo story, you already know that this is going to be, there's going to be a couple things that are problematic about this kind of shorthand retelling. But it's a, but this is what I think this Galileo story kind of holds in our consciousness. In other words, this is a story that is now told uh, just as a very shorthand to prove the idea that religion's incompatible with science. Obviously, Galileo is not burned at the stake. <laughs> Um, uh, we'll get to what actually happened as we go through what the story is. So anyway, it was very interesting. You know, John, I don't want to um, beat John up for that. That's actually a very normal shorthand of how people tell that story. Um, the History Channel has a little thing, This Day in History. Um, any of you who are historians know that the History Channel is not really about history. <laughs> you know, that's not, that's not what's going on with the History Channel. But anyway, um, uh, what the History Channel has for uh, this day in history, a couple, couple weeks from now, when April 12th rolls around, that's day in history, uh, 1633. This is taken now, taken from the website, from the uh, History Channel website. Galileo is convicted of heresy. So we read on the History Channel website, on this day in 1633, Chief Inquisitor Father Vicenzo Maculano de Ferenzuola, appointed by Pope Urban VIII, begins the inquisition of physicist and astronomer Galileo Galilei. Galileo was ordered to turn himself into the holy office to begin trial for holding the belief that the earth revolves around the sun which was deemed heretical by the Catholic Church. Standard practice demanded that he be accused, that the accused be imprisoned and secluded during the trial. This was actually the second time, uh, this is still again reading from the History Channel website, that Galileo was in the hot seat for refusing to accept church orthodoxy that the earth was the immovable center of the universe. In 1616, he'd been for forbidden from holding or defending his beliefs. In the 1633 interrogation, Galileo denied that he held the belief in the Copernican view, but continued to write about the issue and evidence as a means of discussion rather than belief. The church had decided that the sun moved around the earth, I'm sorry, the church had decided that the idea that the sun moved around the earth was an absolute fact of scripture that could not be disputed despite the fact that scientists had known for centuries 
that the Earth was not the center of the universe. This time, Galileo's technical argument didn't win the day. On June 22, 1633, the church handed down the following order, we pronounce, judge, and declare that you, the said Galileo, have rendered yourself vehemently suspect by this holy office of heresy, that is, of having believed and held the doctrine which is false and contrary to the holy and divine scriptures, that the sun is the center of the world, and that it does not move from east to west, and that the earth does move, and that it is not the center of the world. Okay. So, in fact, there's going to be already, you uh, can see a couple things wrong with what, um, uh, uh, what the History Channel here has said. Specifically here, um, the fact that scientists had known for centuries that the Earth was not the center of the universe, that is um, not a fact, in fact. <laughs> so, anyway, so we'll get to that. All right. Um, along the history channel, though it concludes, along with the order came the following penalty: We order that by a public edict, the book of dialogues of Galileo Galilei be prohibited, and we condemn the Galileo to prison of the holy office during our will and pleasure, and as a salutary penance, we enjoin on thee, for the space of three years, thou shalt recite once a week the seven penitential psalms. So Galileo agreed not to teach the heresy anymore and spent the rest of his life under house arrest. It took more than 300 years for the church to admit that Galileo was right and to clear his name of heresy. So that's how the story is, let's say, more uh, elaborately told. Um, it's still going to have a couple of different problems, but this is uh, the more elaborate one than, let's say, Galileo was burned at the stake for uh, using a telescope. <laughs> Okay, so what's the scripture as it's usually referred to? So the scripture in question here um, that the History Channel is talking about is taken from the book of Joshua, chapter 10, verses 12 through 14. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Agilon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jashar? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hastened not to go down for about a whole day. And there was no like that day like that before or after, that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. All right, so um, this is a, um, a biblical narrative uh, in the book of Joshua, this book uh, that is talking about uh, the Israelites conquering the land of Canaan. It's a, bunch of, um, it's a bunch of battles and wars and so on. And in this case, as the people were winning, they needed more time to win, to kill everybody. Uh, so they needed a day to be longer. And so uh, Joshua holds his hand up to stop the sun in its place, and, um, and God makes it happen for, for them, according to this. So this would be a ex case um, that's extremely uh, problematic to read uh, the Bible literalistically like it's a history book. <laughs> so, you know, if for, for fundamentalists who want to do that, um, this would be extremely problematic because, um, you know, Joshua isn't so far into ancient history um, that everybody on the entire planet would have you know, noted that this thing happened and would have written about it. Um, and we'd have lots of additional evidence that such a thing had happened. Um, physically, it's also, you know, you know, impossible for this to have happened as we, you know, as we understand about at this point about momentum and the earth moving and so on. There's no way to read this literally and to believe that this happened. Um, this is a literary story that is in the Bible. But in any event, um, as you can kind of see it here, the uh, author of this text has um, an idea that, that the movement here is that the sun and the moon are moving because that's what you would see as an observer on the earth. Um, so uh, from 
your standpoint as an observer, it seems like the stars and the moon and the sun and so forth are what's moving and we're staying still down here. And so the sun is ordered to stay still and the moon and so forth. Um, what's not really described here though is it's not that uh, the Catholic Church at the time of Galileo uh, was reading this uh, literalistically necessarily. Um, it's in fact actually Galileo who used this scripture in his book of dialogues in order to prove his Copernican theory. So the, the, where he got into trouble is not because um, the church was lead, uh, using scripture and was relying on scripture to prove a, a, different, you know, a different worldview, but rather that uh, Galileo is actually using scripture and interpreting scripture in order to prove his uh, theory. Okay, so we had um, an entire lecture just last week uh, on the Ptolemaic worldview, and we talked about how for, um, uh, anyway, many, many centuries, almost a uh, couple thousand years, uh, this system that had kind of begun uh, much earlier with Aristotle and his predecessors, this idea that the Earth is the center of the universe and is surrounded by uh, celestial spheres, each one of which is, has where the, each one of the moving planets is within until you get to the farthest one, which is the orbit of where all the fixed spheres are. And as we saw uh, in this Ptolemaic or Aristotelian geocentric universe, um, the planets uh, do not quite move in perfect circles around. They have to be accounted for their retrograde motions and so forth in order to explain what uh, the observation data is. Uh, Ptolemy had to create what was called epicycles and other, um, uh, other data changes in order to make the observational data uh, work out. But because he perfected that and the Ptolemaic system was able to explain all of the movements, that held sway for a very, very long time, as we talked about last uh, week. So, um, the geocentric universe. Um, so the theory <coughs> is instrumental rather than a real picture of the cosmos. So in the same way <coughs> that a ball will seem to rotate on an axis, even though there is no physical rod, the celestial spheres are not actually meant to convey a literal picture. The system rather is an instrument for calculating planetary positions. And so, as I said before, you know, essentially astronomy and astrology uh, were one and the same thing in antiquity and all through the Middle Ages. And there was an understanding that, um, you know, because people observed and mostly believed that uh, the moon and its movements were related to the tides, which is actually turns out to be true, um, that they could see that things happening in the heavens were actually happening, affecting the earth. Certainly uh, the sun and its warmth and so on affects, uh, affects the earth. And so it wasn't too huge a leap uh, to have this whole long, large system that all of the movements somehow affected uh, our destinies and so forth, and that's how astrology got going. Okay, so Copernicus, as we kind of talked about uh, last week, uh, was a Renaissance polymath. So he was a mathematician and an astronomer. He had a doctorate in canon law, and he was also a cleric. So in other words, a church canon. He published a book on the revolution of the celestial spheres in 1543, just before his death. This book theorized that the sun is the center of the universe and that the earth was in a celestial sphere that evolves around the sun and that only the moon sphere revolved around the earth. So he made a different kind of system uh, that's much closer to the reality as we know it. So this would be an example of how uh, that system would look. So the sun and the celestial spheres of Mercury, Venus, Earth, with the moon going around the Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and then the fixed stars at the edge. So a fellow cleric, Cardinal Nicholas von Schoenberg, um, encouraged Copernicus in 1536 to publish his findings on heliocentrism. 
Copernicus waited not from fear of the church, but because he feared scholarly scorn to which he would expose himself on account of the novelty and incomprehensibility of his theses. His thesis did receive popular scorn <laughs> and was largely uh, rejected by contemporary scholars. So there were advantages and disadvantages to the Copernican system over and above the Ptolemaic system. So it explains, the Copernican system explains apparent retrograde motion of the planets against fixed stars as caused by the changes in the relative position of the Earth and the planets moving around the sun. And we actually know that that's correct. But so you don't need to have uh, as many epicycles and, and, and accidents and so forth in order to explain it the way the Ptolemaic system. And the apparent motion of the sun and the stars is a result of the motion of the Earth, not the result of the motion of the stars. And we also know that that's the case now too. So those were advantages. However, it was actually no better at predicting planetary positions um, because Copernicus was still relying on um, perfect circular orbits, which are, the orbits are not. Uh, it still required epicycles to explain uh, the planetary positions in order to get the math to work up, uh, work out uh, with the observable data. It did not have a general theory of motion for why the system would work. We talked about that a little bit last week where we talked about how the entire Aristotelian idea of motion is that everything has a purpose and uh, heavier elements purpose is to go closer to the center of the universe, which is the center of the earth. And that's why rocks fall and water falls and why uh, air and fire, for example, go up because they want to go away from the center of the universe and so on. Um, so that's a um, previous idea of motion that it turns out is not correct. Um, but there was no new idea until we got Newton's um, uh, theory of motions. Earth also has three motions that are not observed, and there is no observed stellar uh, parallax. So again, the problem here, um, uh, this is one of the reasons why, though, Copernicus's model, therefore, was not immediately adopted, although in the interim time, Galileo was a big enthusiast. So you can kind of see here, um, at the time when they're first uh, uh, side by side, there are still complexities of having epicycles and other, way, other problems in order to make uh, the observable data work because they still are trying to rely on circles as opposed to ellipses as we know the orbits are. Okay, so um, as uh, Galileo helped to get rid of the Aristotle's theory of motion. Um, this is one of the reasons I think why he also wasn't uh, as wedded to the Ptolemaic model. So Aristotle, as I said, argued that it's the nature of heavy solid objects to seek the center of the universe and for light objects like gases and fire to rise. So for example, in his theory, shooting a cannonball is an unnatural motion, which is why it falls back down. And so again, like I say, prior to 1687, there's really no explanation for the heliocentric universe. Why would the heavy objects not fall to the sun? If the world, as we saw last week too, we talked about this, if the world is turning at a high rate towards the east, why is there no steady breeze coming from the east? So they don't have, um, again, without Newton and the ideas of, of momentum and so on, um, uh, it's not clear why that kind of a thing would happen. If the Earth were rotating, it seems that as though objects at the top of the tower would have a greater eastward motion than those at the bottom, and therefore a dropped object would not only fall, but it would move eastward relative to the tower. We don't see any of that kind of deflection because we now know about inertia and so on. Uh, but at this point, without that theory of motion, it was hard to account for that, right? And finally, um, the stellar parallax is kind of a, was kind of a big deal. So if the Earth is moving the way Copernicus' hypothesis stated, we should see variations, seasonal variations in the position of the fixed stars. So the only reason, the only way that we are not seeing them, because we don't, there is no, the stars don't move around season by season as 
in some, you know, the Earth is observing them from a different angle and so on. The only way that could be the case would be if the stars were just insanely far away and it was hard for anybody to imagine that the universe was that big and so on. Of course, we now understand how much bigger the universe actually is, uh, but at the time it was a it was a pretty serious problem and it was a, a hard for people to um, stomach that argument. Okay, so enter Galileo. Born 20 years after Copernicus published his theory, uh, that theory, like I say, remained largely unaccepted. Um, Galileo was like Copernicus. He's a polymath, a mathematician, an astronomer. Astronomy is the same as astrology, so he's also an astrologer. <laughs> he's a physicist, an engineer, and a philosopher. So unlike Copernicus, he considered the priesthood but did not enter the clergy. Became a mathematics professor at Florence, Pisa, and Padua, and he became the court philosopher for the Medicis in Florence. So Galileo was both a theoretical and a practical natural philosopher, which is now the now what we call a scientist. So in ancient times in the Middle Ages, uh, natural philosophy is the word that we now use for science. So he was famous for experimentation, producing demonstrations of principles that could be replicated. So for example, by dropping different sized objects off of towers, Galileo demonstrated that Aristotle's general theory of motion, that meant that heavy objects would fall faster than lighter ones in direct proportion to their weight, that that's not actually the case, that objects all fall at the same rate. Uh, it turns out even though it seems like, anyway, naturally, uh, and, and, the, and indeed, according to what everybody had always thought ever since Aristotle said it, the heavy ones fall faster. So now that you can drop these and test it and so on, found out that that's actually not, in, not to be the case. Galileo was also interested in practical devices, so technology. So he began telescopic observations in 1609. By 1610, he published a work called Starry Messenger, and he noted, it noted discovering, for example, the Galilean moons of Jupiter. So in that same Copernican model now, the way that had a, a circle that only goes around the Earth is the only circle of sphere that's around the Earth is the moon. Now we find out there are four additional uh, objects that had been unknown because they're you can't see them with the naked eye, but with a telescope you can. The four, as they're even now known, the Galilean moons of Jupiter, um, Io, uh, Callisto, Europa, and Ganymede. Um, now those are understood to be in going in a circle around Jupiter, which kind of makes um, it, anyway, that a little bit of, um, let's say, added detail makes the Copernican model make a little more sense, right? Because now suddenly the moon is not the only object that's doing the strange thing. We found new objects. Galileo's found new objects that are doing the same thing around one of different one of the planets. He also observed that there were mountains on the moon, which had previously thought to be a very smooth, that all the celestial spheres were perfect and so on. Found stars and nebulae unobservable with the naked eye. The Jesuit college in Rome repeated his observations in 1611. So in other words, the church was also, you know, doing science and also was, uh, you know, repeating observations. So continuing observations led to discovering phases of Venus and also sunspots. So in other words, that the sun of all things is not the perfect celestial sphere that we think of it as being, but it actually itself has strange variations. So, prior to any telescopic work, Galileo had written to Johannes Kepler, who was a contemporary astronomer, confiding his shared belief in the Copernican system. The discovery of the four new planets, the Galilean moons, associated with Jupiter made the subsystem look like the Earth-Moon subsystem in the Copernican model. And so you can see here um, on the Copernican model, the Earth with its little moon. Now that we have the four Galilean moons around Jupiter, this is studying, certainly starting to make a little more sense. It's looking more like a model that isn't so odd or uh, where there's one unique planet going around a planet. 
that's now seeming to be a more normal thing. So Kepler is the one who fixes uh, the problems with Copernicus. So an assistant of the Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe, Kepler acquired access to the best astronomical data ever collected in the West. So Tycho Brahe was a naked eye astronomer. He had a huge um, uh, observatory that was created and he, and he uh, got the observational data um, and it was very precise and it was able to use that. So using that data in 1605, Kepler was able to discover that if one assumed the planets moved in elliptical orbits rather than in circular, you could get rid of all of the need for these epicycles that had been around since Ptolemy, right? So the little circles that have to be used to explain why the planets are not uh, moving the way they should if there was a circular orbit. So in other words, now uh, we understand that the orbits are ellipses. The center, the sun is at the center of one of the foci, foci of the ellipse, but not, in, not the other, and so the planets are going around like that. So Kepler also proposed that the motion of the moon was causing Earth's tides. So following Pythagoras and Plato, Kepler believed, quote, that geo the geometrical things provided, uh, have provided the creator with the model for decorating the whole world. And he argued that the relative size of the planetary orbits showed that they were actually based on platonic solids. So in other words, uh, his universe uh, shows that in his theory anyway, uh, the heliocentric universe uh, was based first on the octahedron, the isohedron, I mean, I'm sorry, icosahedron, I guess, uh, the dodecahedron, the tetrahedron, and the cube. Okay, so prior to his death, Tycho Brahe, who was that um, uh, naked eye observer I was talking about, he meanwhile had proposed his own alternate system of the cosmos. So he preserved geostasis, eliminating the need for all of those arguments about unobserved movements. He preserved geocentrism, eliminating the need for an all new theory of motion. And he explained retrograde and other complex motion by having the planets orbit the sun. So in other words, Earth is in the middle, the sun is going around the Earth, but all of the other planets and so on are going around the sun. And so that explains uh, all of these retrograde motions. And so the Tychonic system was actually one of the competing systems at this time and uh, was quite popular uh, because Tycho Brahe was quite a, again, a famous astronomer in this time. Okay, so Galileo dismissed the Tychonic model as inelegant and he took no interest in Kepler's proposals about elliptical orbits, continuing incorrectly to promote the idea of circular orbits. Kepler also rejected Kepler's very correct idea that the, moon, uh, the motion of the moon caused Earth's tides, and he instead developed his own theory that the tides were actually illustrating the fact that the Earth was not stationary. So Galileo was trying to show that the Earth is moving. That's hard to prove when you're on it and we, um, we don't have theories of momentum and we have all this momentum, but essentially um, he's saying the, the tides are happening because the Earth is moving and it's sloshing the water around. Okay, so what's the church's position? Many clerics and church colleges used the heliocentric model in their astronomical calculations. So for example, Cardinal Robert Bellarmine, the papal theologian tasked with investigating disputes over cosmology had no problem with teaching and using heliocentrism as an instrumental theory. However, um, the, the difference for the church was if this were uh, idea to be taught as the truth, as opposed to simply a instrumental model, then the model would have to be demonstrated. So, so Galileo in 1616 wrote a discourse on the tides. As I say, he believed his theory of tidal motion demonstrated that the earth was moving in a manner consistent with Copernican heliocentrism, thus meeting Bellarmine's requirement. In other words, he's trying to demonstrate that the earth is moving. So in a letter to Cardinal Orsini, Galileo made this argument and he also goes on to explain why he considered heliocentrism to be compatible with correct interpretation of scripture. 
So the idea here is, anyway, in terms of why Galileo's idea of the tides is that half of the Earth is rotating in the direction of its orbit and half is against its orbit, and so that's causing uh, the, the water to slosh around. So, okay, so the biblical argument. So the sunspot activity that observed by Galileo, he said, demonstrated that the sun itself was rotating. So Galileo, using that scripture that I quoted above about Joshua and the stopping of the sun, Galileo argued that Joshua's command of the sun to stop moving stopped that rotation. In other words, this rotation that nobody knew that the sun was having until Galileo showed it observationally, as opposed to its apparent movement that is caused by the Earth's rotation. So in Galileo's theory, stopping the sun's motion at the center of the universe, so the fact that the sun is uh, also rotating on its own axis, that is somehow, that rotation the sun is doing is somehow, in Galileo's view, causing the whole system, causing the earth to rotate, and I'm sorry, to revolve around the sun and so forth. And so when Joshua says to the sun to stop, that causes the whole universal system to stop. Uh, because again, because Galileo incorrectly believed that the sun's rotation was causing the entire cosmos to turn. Okay. So Galileo followed Augustine's position. So Augustine of Hippo argued strenuously against literal interpretation of scripture for scientific and historical questions. So uh, Augustine had written a thousand years before this, it, is not, it not infrequently happens that something about the earth, about the sky, about the elements of this world, about the motion and rotation, or even the magnitude and distances of the stars, about the definite eclipses of the sun and the moon, about the passage of years and seasons, about the nature of animals and fruits and stones and other such things, may be known with the greatest certainty by reasoning or by experience, even by one who is not a Christian. So, don't need to be Christian to learn about the natural philosophy, natural world, to learn about science. But Augustine says, it is too great, disgraceful, and ruinous, though, and greatly to be avoided, that the non-Christian should hear a Christian speaking so idiotically on these matters, and as if in accord with Christian scripture, that the non-Christian might say that he could scarcely keep from laughing when he saw how totally in error the Christians are. So in other words, if you read the Bible and then you read it so that uh, you think the earth is only 6,000 years old and is flat and whatever other crazy thing you believe, uh, you, are, you are essentially blaspheming because you, are, um, you don't know what you're talking about and you're misreading scripture and so on. That's been the church's position. Okay, so Bellarmine shared the exact same position on scripture as Augustine, uh, in other words, if and when heliocentrism were to be scientifically demonstrated, scripture would necessarily be reinterpreted to conform to the new understanding. Um, so in other words, what if we knew that the, that the sun was the center of the universe, then we would under, then we could interpret scripture in order to, you know, with that understanding in mind, uh, not using scripture to prove that and, and so on. So Bellarmine dis differed from Galileo on two points. One, whether the science could yet be convincingly demonstrated, and two, who was qualified to reinterpret the scripture when that demonstration occurred. <laughs> so, um, so the church is still saying no 73 years after Copernicus. So most likely in response to Galileo's promotion of heliocentrism, the papacy commissioned an inquisitional report on the topic from a panel of theologians and the report came back with extremely negative recommendations. Copernican books were banned by the church pending correction, and ultimately they didn't require much more, very very minor changes before gaining reapproval. And Bellarmine delivered the bad news to Galileo. So what was the bad news in 1616? An inquisitional document without proper signatures was later, um, found later indicated that this was a total injunction for Galileo to abstain completely from teaching or defending this doctrine and opinion or from discussing it. Galileo's later recollection was that Bellarmine's caution was not an injunction and he had signed a certificate from Bellarmine indicating that, the, that hypothetic discussions were permissional. 
per permissible. So in other words, he could talk about it in a hypothetical way, but just not teach it as, uh, as truth, that it's the heliocentric universe is a theory. Um, then what happened is there was a new pope. So this often happens in, um, I don't know, politics or anything else, you have a new new leader. So Matteo Bar uh, Barberini, a Florentine with Jesuit education, was elected as Pope Urban VIII. So uh, the new pope actually is a big supporter of Galileo's experimentation, and Urban actually encouraged Galileo to write about his tidal theory and to contrast benefits of the geocentric and the heliocentric theories as models. He also requested that Galileo include Urban's own, the Pope's own theological solution to the question. So he had his own theory and his understanding of how the tides would work. So that theory is, I know that if asked whether God in his infinite power and wisdom could have conferred upon the watery element, it's observed reciprocating motion using some other means than moving its containing vessels both of you would reply that he could have, and he would have known how to do this in many ways which are unthinkable to our minds. From this, I forthwith conclude that this being so, it would be excessive boldness for anyone to limit and restrict the divine power and wisdom to some particular fancy of his own. So um, the idea here that Urban is having, I think, is um, we see the tides are doing this, there's clearly a reason why it's happening, um, but nevertheless, if God wanted the tides to be happening, he could make it, there'd be many multiple different reasons to how that could have that effect could have been generated that we can't even think of, um, you know, because God is infinite and so on. So that's, um, that's his own kind of, uh, this, this, uh, the theology um, in this kind of time period is definitely moving in a place towards um, uh, preserving God's power and omnipotence um, at a lot of the expense of many other, um, uh, you know, other, other kinds of things that wouldn't have been, let's say, even anywhere near as conceivable in the central Middle Ages or antiquity, uh, because people became much more concerned with um, not limiting God's omnipotence, okay, in theology. Okay, so about a decade after that urging from the Pope, Galileo published this book with the title Dialogue in 1633. So uh, the dialogue concerning the two chief world systems. This book took the form of a dialogue between a Copernican named Salviati, an educated layman named Segredo, and a Ptolemaicist named Simplicio. So Salviati spends a great deal of time on Galileo's incorrect theory of tides, which Simplicio is not able to counter. So, um, you know, the dialogue going all the way back to Plato is one of the tried and true um, uh, literary conceits for philosophy. And so in the same exact way that Socrates is usually getting the better of all the different people he's talking to, the Copernican philosopher in this case talks circles around uh, the this, what was supposed to be a... Um, let's say an equal exploration of the two systems, not a way to beat up the one system and say, this has got to be the only right one, right? So, okay. So other evidence which Salviati gives in favor of Copernicanism could be explained by the Tychonic system, but there's nobody there to um, uh, argue in the dialogue in favor of Tycho Brahe, Brahe's system. So that's completely ignored. The polemic gives no pretense of balance. Like I say, Salviati runs circles around Simplicio, whose name can easily mean simpleton. <laughs> and worst of all, uh, that idea of the Pope, uh, who had actually encouraged this book, uh, the Pope's idea of divine will, is placed in the end in the mouth of the simpleton. So it does make it seem as though Galileo is calling the Pope a simpleton at the end of this thing. Okay, so Galileo is called to trial in 1633. He's arrested and brought uh, before the Inquisition in Rome. He was charged with violating the 1616 injunction against promoting Copernicanism. In his defense, he showed his own certificate from Bellarmine calling the injunction into question. He was offered a plea bargain 
if he pled guilty to violating the injunction, he expected leniency. So precisely what happened next actually requires some interpretation. So Galileo was convicted of heresy and sentenced to imprisonment by the Inquisition, which was commuted to house arrest for life. However, many of the inquisitors refused to sign the Dutch judgment, perhaps in indicating that they disagreed with the harsher than expected sentence, which was possibly imposed by Galileo's former friend, the Pope that had been maybe publicly humiliated in a political uh, maneuver, as opposed to um, really something that has anything to do with, with heresy. So um, whenever I try to show anyway in this, that um, the story with Galileo is actually originally kind of a messy political trial story between a very um, uh, brilliant guy who was also nevertheless um, uh, involved in the highest, highest levels of politics, you know, the court, uh, uh, court philosopher to the Medici, uh, the Pope was also coming out of that same, um, you know, Tuscan background and so on, and was actually um, an admirer of Galileo and so on, and, and yet uh, maybe expected better treatment, you know, at Galileo's hands, and so maybe it wasn't a, the wisest thing for Galileo to um, write his book the way he wrote it. Um, the other thing that's more a little complicated about it is that um, Galileo was actually quite wrong about many things in his book. So the idea, one, the sun we know is not the center of the universe. Uh, the, or the, the planets are not moving in, in actual circles. Uh, Galileo's theory of the tides is absolutely wrong. So one of the reasons why this story, though, um, got retold and became very popular is um, as Catholics and Protestants uh, fought. Um, Protestants wanted to um, show that they are at the forefront and there were promoters of, of reason and science and so forth. And they wanted to portray Catholics as backwards and uh, authoritarian and so on. And so this story became very popularized by Protestants as an anti-Catholic story. And like I say, in some of the same ways that um, my great-grandfather's story that's too good to stop retelling even when it doesn't necessarily mean anything, uh, it continues to be told now as an anti-religion story, even though um, all the protagonists here are Christians, Galileo is a Christian and who's mostly in trouble for uh, interpreting scripture, for example, uh, when he's not an actual theologian. <laughs> so in any event, um, like I say, sometimes Stories are, uh, we use stories for all kinds of different reasons. And so hopefully this gave a little insight into this particular story. Um, and so now uh, we will end our formal part of the lecture component and we'll see, um, anyway, if you guys have any reactions and or questions. And um, we talked a little bit of deep dive last week into the Ptolemaic universe. So we hopefully have a little bit of a background before we got into this. That was one of the reasons why I wanted to do these two together. I'm going to get a glass of water while I wait. <laughs> um, so Thumper writes, were early Christians as intolerant of science as modern fundamentalists? I mean, they persecuted Hypatia. So, um, so that's another one of these stories that <laughs> gets told for this. Um, the, uh, the story is this, in this particular case is about Alexandria and, um, and a, a case where a, uh, anyway, at a local level, a, a um, non-Christian philosopher, Hypatia, uh, uh, I don't, I don't know, the, I actually have to go through and find the details of the, I remember all the details of the story, I've seen a movie about it and I've, I've read about it, but in any event, this is not necessarily, um, just because the yes, that story happened, um, that is not necessarily emblematic of, um, anyway, the entire movement, right? So the reason why we have uh, all of uh, everything that's preserved classically um, is in part because um, the Abrahamic religions uh, wanted to preserve all of the ancient philosophy and science. So 
Uh, for example, uh, we talked about the uh, transmission of all of Plato and Aristotle through uh, Muslim and, and Arab um, uh, scientists and thinkers. That's also true for Jewish scientists and medieval philosophers and for the Christians. There's a reason why uh, the scientific language uh, in the West is Latin, the same way that uh, the language of the church is Latin, because uh, church and science were one and the same throughout the late antiquity and into the Middle Ages and only have only separated in this time period um, from kind of Galileo on. So I would say no, early Christian, most early Christians are not as intolerant to science as modern fundamentalists, but yes, there were definitely whole bunches of, um, of very intolerant folks. Um, in this case, I think it was a, a group of kind of rampaging um, monks and so on. And so there were always uh, moments when um, people had the attitude, um, you know, burn everything and God will sort it out kind of a thing, or there's an overzealousness and, and not interest in, in book learning. But the, um, like I say, the central way that Christianity was even experienced in the West was through the monasticism, and monasticism is akin to preserving and copying all these books and continuing to study the classics and so on. Dionysus Infinitum asks, how would we compare the church's reaction to Galileo's theory to the church's reaction to Darwin's theory of evolution? Uh, were there major differences or similarities? Um, yeah, that would be a very, I would like to look that up. Obviously, by the time Darwin is around, um, there's, a, there's a bunch of different things that happened. So on the one hand, um, the, now we really are way into the schism in the Western church. So um, the Catholic church is no longer, you know, after the Refor Protestant Reformation, the Catholic church is no longer the Christian church and no longer fully dominant and so on. You know, Darwin is not living in a Catholic country. Um, you know, so now he's having to deal with, let's say, all of the different Protestant reactions. Um, and all of these Protestant reactions, too, um, are varied. And so we also have now gotten to a place um, where Darwin is at, where uh, there has now been this kind of decisive break between, um, let's say, ongoing thinkers who are not using, are not part of the church to do that, and unfortunately, churches that have uh, also diverged from rational thought, where they are uh, moving kind of deep, deeper into literalism and so on, and have become very wedded to um, theories and ideas and even theological views and so on that are uh, increasingly out of date from uh, the understanding of how our understanding of the observable universe and our current theories about um, the natural world. So in other words, that, that long-held um, uh, Augustinian position that, uh, that, uh, that was still very functional, I think, in Galileo's day that the church had, that, which is if we demonstrate um, uh, a new theory of how the world works and how the universe works and so on, that we have to then reinterpret scripture in light of that other um, revealed uh, work of creation that, that tells us about the creator, which is to say creation, they're instead getting fixated on uh, literalism and so forth. So I'd say that by the time we're getting to Darwin's theory of evolution, um, you know, he, so that gets kind of into these famous things like the Scopes monkey trial and so on. Now there really are modern fundamentalists, for example, in the, um, uh, in the United States, the actual um, precursors of modern evangelicals uh, who are, you know, are, are taking up the, the cause and, and, um, and are on the side of uh, error, right, in that. So Daryl Scott, um, what do you think motivates anti-intellectual movements today in history? Um, and, and a related question from Bob Garrison, how can people like Ken Ham insist that the Bible, especially Genesis, are literally the way it is? Um, yeah, so, <laughs> well, unfortunately, this is, I think, a, um, this has become a really big um, plague of our time. 
So I think that we have, we are living in an information age and we thought maybe originally that uh, access to information was going to um, um, make us all smarter, <laughs> you know? But one of the things that has happened instead is you get, you can get into um, uh, silos and you can get into, you know, a um, disinformation universe where you have an entire tribe of uh, like-minded people that are, um, that are essentially saying the same things to each other, whether, whether they uh, uh, are coincide with reality or not. Um, and there's all kinds of different um, reasons why those are, are soothing and become very popular. Um, I think that one of the, the, the problems is uh, we have very little um, good training in uh, information literacy, being able to judge and weigh different kinds of information. Um, we have uh, largely um, rejected and broken down. We don't, we don't believe often in authority anymore, and that was kind of a good thing intellectually, which is just don't want to just take it on authority, uh, because just because Aristotle said it, that um, heavier things fall faster. It turns out they don't, you know? So there's a good reason to um, not just uh, appeal to authority and have uh, and just listen to whatever the authority has to say. Uh, nevertheless, we haven't successfully, um, I think, done training where people are able to weigh the different sources of information. So they're just as likely to um, be scammed in a number of easy ways where where people use, you know, just basic kind of tricks to, um, you know, by creating false memes and so on, and 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 that can affect markets and people can play those. And, and in other words, there's all kinds of different ways that you can um, manipulate information and have those kind of things. Um, in terms of, in terms of um, why do people, what motivates an anti-intellectual movement? So um, there's, a, there's a natural desire that people have um, that they want to have a, uh, an answer be very explainable. Um, and so they don't want to have, um, if there's a big meltdown or something like that, a big financial crisis, they would rather have um, whatever, some, you know, they'd rather have George Soros be involved, which is simply more or less, you know, the old uh, Jews are controlling the world, banking conspiracy, anti-Semitism thing that goes all the way back to that. Um, uh, and so anyway, it's, it's easier to have, um, you know, like a scapegoat or a conspiracy, even when that doesn't conform to reality at all. And for people who, um, who can't really judge between information and don't know these things very well anyway, it's very comforting to them uh, often to have the secret information that they know and that they can remember and share that all the people around them don't know. It's a way to um, think, uh, anyway, it's a way to, to, to have your own kind of a power situation when you otherwise would be powerless maybe. Um, regarding like uh, people like Ken Ham, so this is, um, you know, you can just pull into just fantasy thinking. Um, and once you've just, you have a worldview that is uh, just completely um, divorced from um, observable reality. So you have a worldview that is not accurately predictive of reality. So you, um, it's problematic and dangerous because if you think, um, the world will do those things that actually will turn out that it doesn't. So all of the things that it doesn't pre prepare you for uh, things that could come in the future. Uh, you might think if you do this, this, and this, and this, uh, you'll only be blessed and you'll always be um, uh, made wealthy if you give enough money to the televangelist or whatever, but then uh, then you get cancer. Why did that happen? <laughs> you know, so um, it, it unfortunately, when you have a um, worldviews that aren't reality-based, you're not prepared for reality when uh, when things that your worldview don't predict uh, will inevitably happen. Um, uh, Brando asked, does the lecturer know about Galileo making the Medici coat of arms as Jupiter and its moons? No, I did not know that. That's very interesting. <laughs> um, what, a, what a cool thing. So yeah, the um, that's, good, that's good to know. I'll, I'm going to look up the picture of that when I get home. Um, it was a, probably it's such a cool thing to have had happen, you know, so nobody um, 
nobody up until you know the, the entire Ptolemaic system those that's what you could observe that's all the planets that you have uh, and now suddenly Galileo there's four more and you get to name them and you know Ganymede and so on um, <clears throat> so Project Malice asks from an earlier video Joseph Smith returned to an earlier idea of God did he return to an earlier Catholic ontology like earth-centered no. So, um, so Joseph Smith is, um, you know, kind of on the American frontier in a time, at the, the time period when, let's say, Galileo's at the front of this, what's going to eventually the end of the Renaissance, but it's also going to go into the Enlightenment eventually and so on, when we are starting to have all of these, um, uh, let's say, all of these uh, additional, you know, things that we learn about the universe um, um, but it's still a time period when people in the countryside who aren't particularly ex educated like Joseph Smith think you could still read the Bible literally, um, uh, but then if you just make a few fixes. <laughs> and so, for example, um, uh, Joseph Smith very much believes in a, a Copernican, a heliocentric uh, universe, and I don't even know if he thinks, yeah, he doesn't even think that the sun is the center of the universe. In other words, he has content, he's up to date with it, um, and he, um, for example, uh, writes a um, vision of Moses where Moses um, is shown by God um, how the universe really is and how, um, uh, how the earth is so much smaller than Moses ever imagined. In other words, that the uh, the Earth is, you know, distant from the Sun, and there's all these other stars, and so on. And he never, and at the end of that vision, Moses ne it, uh, didn't realize how he'd never thought that before. He never had that in understanding of, of of how mankind is off on the edge of a, of a tiny universe comparatively. Um, and likewise, uh, Joseph Smith has a, writes a vision of Abraham that Abraham has with God, where he's looking at the stars and so forth, and um, and uh, imagines a, a another star, you know, that is possibly serious. We don't know. It's called uh, Kolob, which is uh, the star where God's planet is and so forth. And so it is attempting to actually, I'd say, bring um, the biblical worldview actually up to date with uh, the understanding of science that, as, as Joseph Smith understood it anyway, in the 1830s. Anyway, very good. Well, anyway, this was a little bit of a... Um, a dive down into one really particular topic, but I also wanted to talk a little bit about then also stories and how do we have identity stories, why do we tell stories, and 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 how do we um, maybe continue to tell them when uh, when they don't really have the meaning that uh, that if the, the actual history of it. That's why history historians are no fun. We always debunk everyone's identity stories. <laughs> All right. So very uh, much we'll, looking forward to next week when we're going to talk about uh, Joseph Smith and the origins of Mormon polygamy.